Fairness is arguably the central word in our moral lives. Violations of fairness are really powerful. They burn, they, they can ruin relationships in an instant. A sensitivity to fairness is extremely early developing. Right now we're studying infants in the first three months of life. We're excited to see how this turns out. Kids don't really have a say in what's fair, what's not. It's always the adults that tell you. And then when we don't have a say, then the adults can do what they want, and we can't do anything to stop them. Imagine if there was a concept of fairness that people could use to hold politicians to account. Now, that, I think, would be a first. I would say the question is, why does oppression matter? Why does it matter that entire groups of people don't have the same kind of opportunity and access that others do? Fairness is, is an acceptance that we live very interconnected lives. We need to roll back on this idea that the only thing, the only measure of success is financial wealth. I mean, one of the most striking features of modern world is the fact that inequality has risen in democratic countries without any real popular uprising. How is it that so many people can view these huge inequalities as fair? Why do people accept the kind of winner-takes-all society? What you will see today is a lab experiment that looks at economic decision making. Up to now, much of economic reasoning has been that all inequalities are bad. But what we will see today is that people, well, people have different ideas about that. So some people say, well, there are fair inequalities and there are unfair inequalities. Okay, so everybody should now see the instructions. Just take your time and read them carefully and let us know when you have questions. They will first do a task, they will add numbers, and they will earn points by doing that. Then we match or pair two participants who have both been part of this. Then we say to each of them, well, now it's your choice. I mean, here is the total amount of money that you and this other guy produced. And you are now to decide how to share this pie. It's a very simple task. And, and that's it. Nothing will happen afterwards. I mean, if you take all the money, you can, you can take all the money home. If you share it, you, the other guy will get some of the money. We want to have people make decisions in real economic situations where there are real stakes. So when we tell them that they're going to earn money, <laughs> they actually earn money. Okay, so I, I'll start explaining uh, what we found in the experiment we did. People who produce less than others, they actually give away much more. This notion of fair meritocracy as fairness, this notion that a guy who has done better deserves more, is a powerful notion and we see it very clearly in this experiment. People are willing to accept almost any inequality, if they view it as a result of a competition. This is something you have from sports, right? Even if somebody just wins by a millisecond, he deserves gold and, and all the money. Uh, and we find that fair. And essentially, I think some of that logic is taken into the economic sphere. We need to think carefully about how the institutions are shaping the future generation's ideas of fairness. 
So in Norway, it's the case that, I mean, kids are treated in an extremely egalitarian manner up till they are around 12 years old, before ad uh, adolescence. So then there is no very little grading in school. When you play football, if your team is down, you are allowed to add players, so it evens out. So there are all these egalitarian institutions. But actually, this changes a lot in Norway when kids go into adolescence. Then the institutions become very meritocratic. We really reward the better performers in sports. We start grading and so on. And I mean, the institutions shape their ideas of fairness and turn them into meritocrats. Another really, really fascinating line here is a lot of people, about 30%, actually don't give anything. They don't give anything to the other guy. Students are actually outliers typically, and in particular students at the business school. <laughs> You're actually looking at the most selfish group that we more or less have identified, apart from very young kids. <laughs> business students are the most selfish people you could, would ever meet. I earned £60,000 when I was 26. You shouldn't have put your ginger in just at this yeah, point, really. Mistake. But it doesn't matter. But you just need to cook this yeah, until, yeah, yeah. until it's golden brown, OK? Yeah, so the long I had an old school friend who is now a teacher. I would have been in my early 30s. She didn't think that it was fair that I got paid so much and she got paid so little. And I argued with her. And I said, well, you know, people like me, we're, um, you know, we're hard to find. There's market, market principles behind this, you know? I mean, you know, there's lots of people who could be a teacher, but there's not that many people who could do what I do. Did you burn it? Yeah, well, I, I burnt it too, so I can't really criticize. I burnt it three times, so I... <laughs> Why do we get paid so much? There's just so much money floating around in the city and there's so much scope to make money when you're dealing with millions, hundreds of millions, possibly even billions. Honestly, if you'd have gone around the city and you'd just forced everybody's salaries down by half, how many people would actually have left? I don't think anyone would have left. So if, you, if you'd like to buy that, it's only 50p okay. for, 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 for all of it. Bags of Taste is a behavioural change programme that um, ultimately they go through the whole thing and they find that they magically cook at the end of it. We design recipes that cost less than one pound a portion to make so that they're comparable to fast foods and things. We know that there's an issue of debt amongst people who are on lower incomes. So much of where we are in life is luck. And I don't know how many people really appreciate that. They always think it's their own merit. And in fact, the research shows that it generally isn't their own merit. It's very often luck. Um, but the richer you are, the more you think that you're just brilliant, you know. And, and yeah, I think I'm brilliant. Of course, I think I'm brilliant. But I am also very conscious that it's just luck. The people that I met, the parents that I, I had, the education I was given. And I see people that have nothing of what I have, literally nothing, and they were just unlucky. I just don't think that's fair. That just isn't fair, and, and, and if I can help that, I will. You know, um, I stopped short of selling my house and equally distributing all the money to everybody. So that probably is, you know, my own... That's, that's, that's my own limit. <laughs> London is a playground for the rich, a treadmill for the middle classes, and a warehouse for the poor. And our purpose, at least my purpose, my intention, is to try something new, really. It's to see if we can have a debate about fairness that results in Londoners owning what fairness is, as opposed to politicians. And I'll just be honest, I get completely and utterly fed up with the notion that, you know, it doesn't matter which political party, somebody's telling us what's fair and what isn't. It's a bit like social justice, like department directors. So, uh, you own fairness. Londoners own fairness. You decide what fairness is. 
if you can create a consensus that fairness can be owned by the people, it actually speaks to the notion that our politicians should fear the public, not the other way around. And I think it's cheating when politicians on the left or the right or the centre say, well, it's, you know, that's fair or unfair. The question they should be asking is, what do you think? The thing that I find obscene is the term affordable for housing. It's a leap. You know, look at Maslow's hierarchy. <laughs> Having a roof over your head is one of those basic needs. The Fairness Commission was the first London-wide attempt to look at fairness across the city. And it's the first attempt to do that, really, since about 1890. Um, Booth, um, who invented the poverty line. When we're talking about fairness, what does that mean? When we, so we've got legislation, we've got policies, we've got practice. What I hope to achieve through the Fairness Commission is what constitutes a fair city? Um, what policies mitigate towards fairness? All I keep thinking back to is people just sitting and doing hundreds of applications and not hearing back about anything. The most visceral feelings, the most deep feelings of unfairness were in London's young. Some parents, some parents want to help their kids, but they can't because of this and this and that. The notion of meritocracy is a fantasy. Poor kids that are born intelligent, i.e. more intelligent than their richer counterparts, are overtaken by their less intelligent, wealthy counterparts by the age of seven as a direct result of, the, of access, privilege. Now, that can't be good for society. OK, the next one is house prices. Where am I going to live, says Hannah? There's a feeling, certainly when I talk to you people in London, that they are being cut out of the equation. I would not want to see a capital city which has... Uh, well, it's been a kind of social cleansing. People have called me an idealist. A fairness Commission, what a ridiculous thing, you know. It strikes me that often the people who say the world is unfair get used to it, are the people who've benefited <laughs> from, <laughs> from unfairness. I believe human beings are born with a sense of fairness. But society can just structurally condition people to not give a damn, really. Or it create the conditions in which people will choose to go with what is inherently human nature. Our work largely looks at notions of helping and harming. Your head is like half your body weight. Good work. Thank you very You're much. There's a sense in fairness in how people should treat each other. And so I'm really curious to discover um, whether that has any origins in infancy. Luna, do you want to play a game with us? Sure. Wanna go play yeah. a game? Should we go play a game? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Can mommy come too? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. In this study, we're asking whether infants are responding nicer to those who've been nice to others and potentially less nicely to um, those who've been mean to others. Infants first watch a interaction where there's one character who has an unfilled goal. He's trying and failing to jump up onto a shelf to get an airplane toy. One of them runs up, jumps on top of the shelf, and gives the boy the airplane toy. So this is the nice puppet. <coughs> the other puppet is the mean puppet. Later, we show infants that one of the characters, either the, the girl who was nice or the girl who was mean, has a preference for one kind of toy over another. What we do is see whether infants respond differently depending on whether the character was helpful before or unhelpful before. Oh, goody! Can you give me one?
what we find is that when children are interacting with the mean puppet, about a third of them say, no, you can't have anything at all. About a third of them give her the toy that she disliked, and about a third of them give her the toy she liked. So they seem much less careful about being nice if you were previously mean to somebody else. Can you give me one? When they do give something to the one that was nice, they all give the toy that she liked. Hello. Hello. Want that, Mr. Lion? Give him a big hug. So sweet. We find that very young infants are already sort of showing positive emotional benefits from being generous. Yeah. You don't mind sharing. You just didn't want to share with that nasty puppet. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right now in the lab, we're running studies looking at whether younger babies also show the same patterns. Where are you going? Are you practicing your baby push-ups? At least by three months of age, infants seem particularly sensitive to harm. To me, that is the strongest evidence that there is something innate going on here because it's unlikely, I would argue, that they're experiencing in the first couple of months of their life much antisocial action happening in their environment. Animal puppets? Do you want to see some animal puppets? No. Yeah. One thing that we found with infants that's like not particularly nice, infants seem to have very strong in-group biases. They like it when you help strangers. They like it when you help those who they like. But they like it when you harm those who they dislike. Hey, you want to try some? She's a Cracker fan. <laughs> Blech! Yuck! I don't like graham crackers. Infants as young as nine months of age like it when you harm those who simply don't share their food preference. The similarity of a baby to an adult is sort of very striking. They have this ability to show remarkable bias depending on very simple, you know, do you, are you similar to me or not? Well, I can't hold anymore. Oh. So it seems as though the origins of sort of liking goodness and fairness may be present extremely early on, but also the origins of biases for the in-group and disliking difference in other individuals, that's present really early on too. And so um, development might be learning to sort of distinguish between um, what is the right kind of fair behavior and what's the wrong kind. is one of those things that people feel very strongly about. One of the things that we'd like to know more about is why. What's the evolutionary function of this behavior? So this is the primate center. And we can go inside and see the monkeys. I have gloves on when I'm touching food. Generally speaking, the sweeter something is, the better they like it. So um, one good way of judging what they're going to like best is if it's expensive in the supermarket, that means they like it. So, so their most preferred foods are the grapes. Um, and their second most preferred food is actually cucumbers. So they like cucumbers quite a lot. And then their least preferred food is the bell peppers. So when we do these studies, what we're really measuring is inequity hey aversion, or how individuals respond when they get a less valuable reward than their partner okay. does. See these? Those are food calls. The little it means they're excited. So what we're going to do is this is Logan and this is Liam. And we're going to do a trade. And Liam's going to trade, and he's going to get a bell pepper. And then Logan's going to trade and get a grape. So sometimes we get really interesting responses where they get very upset. So they'll bang on the cage or throw tokens, or sometimes they'll just go in the back and they'll refuse to come over and interact with us at all. Here you go, Logan. Good job. See this? Liam. Here you go, Liam. Can I have that back? Not interested? 
We don't quite understand why fairness causes this outraged reaction, but we know it does. The question is, if people are getting enough, why should they care if some individuals are getting more? And yet we clearly do. The reaction to fairness itself is probably actually at heart an emotional reaction. It's just that, that frustration, that moment of realization that you're getting less. No. Good try. One of the hypotheses about the sense of fairness is that it's a mechanism by which individuals determine the value of their cooperative partners. If you're working with someone else and you began to feel frustrated because you feel like they're taking more than you, then that can be an easy rule of thumb that it's time to go find another cooperative partner. And this is true whether you're talking about humans or to other species such as primates or dogs or wolves. Liam. 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 For a long time, cooperation was ignored because it was considered to be antithetical to this idea of natural selection, where it's every individual for themselves. Oh. <laughs> They're faster than I am. And it's true that that is the goal of evolution, but that overlooks the fact that sometimes you can best meet that goal by working together. See this? And that's where I think we could learn a lesson from capuchin monkeys. And we need to be careful not to always be the ones that are dominating and taking the grape and make sure that others get them sometimes as well. There is a lot of cutting down on transfers to poor people, to single household families in the US and throughout Europe. And what validates this is this idea of personal responsibility or deservingness. The poor should be held responsible for their choices. So this is a very powerful notion, but it raises an enormously important, <coughs> complicated question, namely, so what is a choice? In this experiment, your choice will definitely come. This is not like a survey question or hypothetical or anything like that. You actually determine it. So we will actually transfer the money you have decided that each of them should get, and this will be implemented within a few days. The students were actually facing a real situation where two people had worked for the choice lab. These two guys had just randomly been paid differently. So one guy was paid 800 and the other guy had been paid nothing. And now we ask some of the students, uh, you want to redistribute between the guy who earned everything and the other, other nothing for the same job? And most students say, yes, yes, we want to do that. So here, worker A was more lucky. And for me, it was equal that we treated it equally. So I gave four, 400 of what A got to B. OK, so that was the base treatment. Now we did two manipulations, so some of you looked at different treatments, and here are these different treatments. In this case, it was a choice that had no value. I mean, they would still be exposed to the luck. So you can either just take 25 points for sure, or you can choose to take part in a lottery. And the winner of the lottery will get 800, a loser will get zero. As soon as choice is introduced to the picture, People say, well, now the inequality is acceptable to a much greater extent. I mean, they did a choice. Um. And, well, yeah, I thought uh, this guy lost the lottery that he chose to participate in, and so... Excellent. So, so let's just... Well, a lot of people claim that the situation that the poor are in is their responsibility because it reflects choices they did. It reflects that they didn't take any education. It reflects that they uh, divorced. It reflects that they don't work full time. But now we have to step, take one step back and say, well, yes, they did these choices. But what were the alternatives? Could they really, I mean, pursue an education without giving up everything, basically? Well, could they even access education? This is, of course, an even deeper question. So, so basically, it, I think it, this is tremendously important because it raises this fundamental question. When we see this kind of justification for cutting down on transfers to the poor, is this a good justification or not? We know in the US that personal responsibility is brought into the discussion about health and many other issues. Do we think that the people who reported to be left-wing behave differently than the people reporting to be right-wing? Any thoughts?
I was very, very much on the left. I hated Ronald Reagan. I loved Bill Clinton. I began studying political psychology in the early 2000s because I couldn't stand how badly the Democrats were doing. They just didn't know how to talk about morality. And, and I began studying political psychology in order to help the Democrats speak better was my part of my goal. Um, and in the process of studying political psychology, I, I made a commitment to really understanding conservatives. I read conservative books and magazines, I listened to the way they talk, and I came to see that they're not crazy, that actually there are a lot of insights into society, family, marriage, respect, um, that are quite important for running a decent society. Uh, I ended up basically dropping out of politics. I, I'm nonpartisan, I, I try to understand all sides. The left is really focused on equality. They, uh, they focus on our different groups being, getting equal outcomes, and obviously they're not. We have big racial differences in wealth, uh, in health, and education. So if you focus on equality of outcome, we sure don't have it in America, and the left focuses on that. But if you focus on proportionality, that is, are people getting out in proportion their inputs, well, you know, certain ethnic groups have much higher rates of employment and marriage. They raise their kid, they devote themselves to their kids. Asians in America do extremely well. They're richer than whites. Is that unfair? Uh, on the right, people say no. On the right, people say, if you work hard, you should get ahead. One of the most important factors causing racial inequality in this country is that the black family began to disintegrate in the 1960s. Daniel, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote a report on this, warned that if out-of-wedlock birth rates keep rising, it's gonna be a disaster for African Americans. He was called a racist, people wouldn't talk to him. How dare you blame black people for their, for, by saying that they've contributed to the inequalities and to the problems in society. Well, it turns out Moynihan was exactly right. Uh, things have gotten much, much worse for the black family. Uh, marriages, along with education, the two gigantic causes of success or failure in life. If you're raised in an unstable family environment without married parents, you're unlikely to move up. Whereas if your parents are married and you're poor, you're very likely to move up. Um, so we have this mess in the social sciences in the United States in which our social scientists will not consider hypotheses that in any way implicate sacred victim groups. And this, I believe, has led to the breakdown of the social sciences, not in all matters, but in matters that involve race, gender, class, other highly politicized topics. I tweeted out this, um, this tweet stream about privilege. And I essentially compared it to walking up to the bank and having an extra million dollars in your bank account. You have no idea where it came from. You know it wasn't a part of your salary. You know you didn't earn it some kind of way. First, you might look at it suspiciously, but eventually you start to spend it, and you spend it on things that you care about, right? You spend it on your family, you spend it on your friends, you spend it on buying a better house, getting your kids into a better school, making sure your child doesn't have to take out loans for college, all the right things, right? Eventually, though, you start to convince yourself that it was yours all along because you don't remember what it was like to ever live without it. Suddenly, it just becomes so natural and so innate to you that you have convinced yourself that you deserve it and that anyone who tries to take it from you, even though it wasn't yours in the first place, is a thief. That million bucks was not given to you freely. It was given to you off the backs of people who suffered, who shouldn't have been stolen from, and yet you refused to let go. There are about 60 kids that um, I taught third graders who were so brilliant and so curious and thoughtful and funny and kind and just all of the things that lots of people don't believe about them are true. All of my children were black except for one. All of them lived in a low-income neighborhood. I think when children experience inequity, it severely limits their imagination. Children see what other schools look like, what their facilities look like, and wonder why is my school not the same? And they can't see themselves participating in innovation. They're already starting to internalize those things. People will say, you know, 
this is about being politically correct. No, it's actually about treating people as people and recognizing that marginalized people deserve the same full range of access that everyone else does. I absolutely just don't think it's fair to say it, it all comes down to the parents and how much they nudge you when parents have been acculturated to certain things, have experienced inequity themselves. A lot of them were caught in circumstances where the kind of time, the access to opportunity that they want to be able to provide their children is not actually available to them. Privilege is very real and you know it when you're on the rough end of it, yeah. It reaches in every single direction and to every single age you could possibly imagine. That's a big one. Right now you're stating. Don't make me fucking run around here with 30 pounds of goddamn gear on the sun because you want to screw around out here. Y'all keep standing there and run your mouths. We're going to go too. Get out of here. I already told you. You are leaving now. We want to consider ourselves living in a modern time where systems of the past, like slavery and colonialism and feudalism, no longer shape our world. We have a sense about how unfairness in the past functioned, and we celebrate that we are not that. Yet in reality, we are post-colonial societies, post-slavery societies, um, post-feudal societies, which means that there are elements of those old systems still playing out. Some people are just structurally in a disadvantaged position, and that means other people are in an advantaged position. If you're uncomfortable hearing that, it means that you're not really prepared to see how our society structures all sorts of things. Fairness and justice are distinct concepts. The challenges that all countries have to face is a global phenomenon for the United States, and I would be willing to wager in most countries, some groups have less power in the political system and in access to justice. For example, um, black women are least likely to have their cases uh, believed by police officers, least likely to have their um, alleged rapists prosecuted and least likely when they are prosecuted to see them convicted and when they do get convicted their uh, sentences are far less than the sentences of other uh, individuals who've been uh, prosecuted and convicted so what what this uh, shines a light on is the fact that while all women are vulnerable um, the consequences how they are treated whether they're believed whether their cases go forward largely tracks onto social hierarchy. It's a two-pronged problem. Things happen to them because of who they are, and they can't seek accountability because of who they are. जैसे शादी होके हमने यहाँ आई तो पहले तो हमको बड़ा अजीब सा लगा लेकिन जब हमारे सास ससुर ने हमारे को बोला कि ये जागीरी के तौर पे आपको ये काम करना पड़ेगा कुछ मतलब दूसरी जात में तो जागीरी के तौर पे दूसरा मिलता है लेकिन हमारे को सुबह से उठके लोगों की लेटरिंग झाड़ना पड़ती इसपे मेच करना पड़ेगा 
तो उसमें से डेढ़ घर मेरे को और मेरे जिठानी को दिए उन्नीस सौ का कानून बना एक्ट के जिसमें मेला ढोना और ढुलवाना दोनों ही गैर कानून है लेकिन कानून को वही लोग कानून के जो रखवाले रहते वो नहीं के वहाँ ही हमारे को ये कच्ची लेटरिंग साफ करने जाना पड़ता था लेकिन अब करे क्या इंसान और देखने जाओ एक महीने में जो मंथली होता है उसमें खाली दस रुपया मिलता है काम करते उसके बाद हमको रोटी लेने जाना पड़ता है क्या करे और इतना घूंघट इतना काढ़े हुए इतना सारा घूंघट काढ़े हुए इतना पहन ओढ़ के और पूरा देखो मत किसी से बोलो मत इतने उसमें रखते थे हमारे को कि सिर्फ एक काम करने की मशीन है जाने और ज्यादा से ज्यादा महिलाओं पे आके टिक जाती है बात महिलाओं को क्यों इतना दबा रखा है क्यों इतना सब चीजें बांध रखा ये होना ये होना ये होना इसके बगैर आप कहीं नहीं जाओगे इसके बगैर आप कहीं नहीं जाओगे एक ही पहचान बना रखी है मेरा ये मतलब कि ये आपके लिए क्यों नहीं आदमी के लिए क्यों नहीं शादी के बाद जैसे ही मालूम पड़ा कि पढ़ाई मेरी पढ़ाई बिल्कुल अधूरी थी मैंने फार्म भरा और मैंने दसवीं का फॉर्म भर के मैंने पढ़ाई करी लेकिन काम भी करा और पढ़ाई भी करी और आज मैंने बारहवीं तक पढ़ाई कर ली है तो हमने फिर ये काम बंद करा पहले तो बच्चों को पढ़ाने में करने लगे वही मास्टर टीचर जो रहते शर्मा जी वर्मा जी थी ये बोलते ही कह रहे तेरी माँ ने तो हमारे यहाँ का काम बंद कर दिया तो तुम तुमको हम नहीं पढ़ाते क्योंकि बच्चे तो सबसे पीछे बिठा देते थे इसके लिए तो समाज ही है क्योंकि समाज के लोगों ने तो बनाया है जो दूसरी जात के उनके हिसाब से रहना है समाज कुछ भी नहीं काम करेगा इस समाज के लिए अपने आप को लड़ने के लिए आगे आना पड़ेगा हर समुदाय से आना पड़ेगा एक समाज है और एक समाज के अंदर एक लेडीज है और एक जेंट्स है बस मैं ये चीज मानती हूँ ये ठीक है If you want to look at the history of injustice across millennia, you'll find it written in the tax codes. And some of the earliest available literature, Rosetta Stone, for example, are essentially tax codes. Um, because they do shape the, the outcomes of, of social justice uh, to an extraordinary degree. If we look at the way that multinational companies operate, because they're working in more than one country, it throws up issues about how will the wealth they create be distributed. And that was addressed by the League of Nations. And at that time, that's in the 1920s and the 1930s, the powerful em empire countries, Britain, France, Germany, they dominated the discussion and shaped rules which suited their purposes. They were damned if they were going to give taxing rights to the poorer countries, their colonies. The United States also was instrumental in shaping rules which suit them. The rules allow them to pretend that their profits are derived in some company set up in Bermuda or Cayman or Jersey or wherever. Um, and everyone knows that's a complete fiction, but the rules allow that to happen. It's been so corrupting. It, I think it's undermined democracy. It's undermined the rule of law. It's given this clear sense that there is one rule for the rich and quite another for the vast majority of us. And I think that has also corrupted our sense of fairness. What's the scale of this offshore economy? I commissioned some research into this from a specialist research agency. Their estimate, based on 2010 data, is that somewhere between 21 trillion to 32 trillion US dollars of private wealth sits offshore, untaxed. Now, a trillion, for those of you whose salaries don't go up to the trillions, 
A trillion is a million million. We're talking staggering amounts of wealth sitting offshore, untaxed. One of the things that's really pissed me off big time has been the way in which a corruption debate was shaped in the 1990s, in which we pointed fingers at the South and said, is your corruption that has led to underdevelopment and poverty and inequality and so on. You can't blame them exclusively for not delivering on human rights violations when they don't have the money and when they're being deprived of the money. If tax haven countries like Britain and Switzerland and Luxembourg are actively helping the elites and the powerful multinational companies to avoid paying taxes in some of the poorest countries in the world, are they not also complicit in abusing the human rights of the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world? I've often been told by people who really should know better, academics, senior practitioners, professionals, and they say, well, John, we know the system's unjust, but you can't change the system. And just those three words, you can't change the system. Actually, give me a think of those four words. Anyway, just those words, you can't change the system, angers me so much. The system is man-made. Of course you can bloody well change the system. These are the documents at the heart of the LuxLeaks scandal. 28,000 confidential pages which list more than 500 tax agreements between multinationals and the tax administration in Luxembourg. Giants like Apple, IKEA and Amazon obtained so-called tax rulings which allowed them to pay tax rates as low as 1%. The three French men who leaked the documents revealing the sweetheart deals are now going on trial. The main suspect is Antoine Del Tour, a former employee of audit firm PwC. If convicted, Del Tour and the two other men face up to 10 years in prison and a fine of more than 1 million euros. My, my decision to become a whistleblower didn't come one day. I... As an auditor, I was highly motivated. It was my first job, and I was appreciated. I, I've been promoted just before resigning. I discovered that some uh, companies were only holdings with no real uh, economic activity uh, that, had, that were in Luxembourg just to, to shift profits from uh, the countries where the real activity, uh, economic activity is, to shift profits to Luxembourg to avoid paying tax. Big multinationals uh, avoid tax while uh, uh, normal citizens and small business have to pay uh, uh, a huge burden uh, and suffer from austerity measures. And it's also uh, because uh, multinationals themselves uh, use uh, public services like roads, like uh, skilled uh, uh, workforce, etc. So they, they need, um, they need, they should contribute to these uh, public services, and they don't. So th that's not fair. As a citizen uh, who has a conscience, and you don't have much opportunities to to change things. There is something wrong in, in these tax practices and I, I knew that uh, the opinion and the politicians deserved to be informed about it. The case is embarrassing for the former Prime Minister of Luxembourg, Jean-Claude Juncker. He now heads the European Commission, which says it wants to make tax issues a priority. Tax evasion costs Europe 1 trillion euros a year. I think about uh, LuxLeaks consequences uh, every day, uh, especially just before the, the trial. I, I'm always thinking about uh, uh, about it, and uh, and I'm afraid of what could happen. Uh, um, I, I, I face. I, I, I don't think I, I will go to jail, but maybe I, I will have to pay uh, one million, or I don't know, uh, much much more than what I, I can pay, and. Uh, um, this is a, a threat.
quality has become a very popular way of capturing some of the dilemmas we're facing in the development of our societies. We need to really unpack that concept. Because you could have a society that's very equal in income terms, where it just happens to be that everyone is poor. And that, to me, doesn't seem like a very good or fair society. For me, fairness feels different. It feels like the right concept, because it's asking about what's really happening to make sure that everyone is meeting the right standards. Costa Rica is a really interesting example. It has a level of social progress better than Italy, a G7 country, but a much, much lower GDP, about a GDP less than half that of Italy's. The Social Progress Index is really asking the question, what is a good society? And we define it in sort of three terms. One is, does everyone, every citizen, have the basic needs for survival met? Secondly, does every citizen have those building blocks of a better life, like education? And thirdly, is every citizen free to pursue their hopes and dreams without impediments? So do they have rights and freedom of choice, those kind of things? So that way, it's actually a very good measure of a fair, good society. <laughs> We saw Costa Rica in the 19th century introducing universal primary education. And then we see into the 20th century a country that has prioritised the well-being of its citizens in various ways, <laughs> including abolishing having an army, making a welfare state in the 1940s. Costa Rica, I know that we are like, we are very successful in transforming every dollar we produce in social benefits. I mean, if you have a good education access and health access, you can, you can have a pretty decent life, even though you are not the richest man on earth. You have to feel like you live in a, in a fair society in order to really work uh, to improve yourself and therefore improve the community. My cousins, they can have aspirations to be professionals or whatever they want, and they, they, they are able to really envision their future. And I think that's a different thing in this country because it's not as common as one may think it is. So. So social progress in Costa Rica has been really laid down over time by lots of investments. Social progress isn't built overnight. It's about a consistent effort over time. Governments ultimately are the ones who are at the, sort of the top of the pyramid. They control the law. Um, as Max Weber said, they have the monopoly on the violence in the society. So there's a, there's a point whereby the buck does stop with government. Parliament. 
a massive demonstration ensued, what some locals called the largest public demonstration in Iceland's history. The Pirate Party has seen a surge of support following the publication of the Panama Papers. One poll has the Pirate Party at 43%. Actually, we have gone from, yeah, 5% to 43%, and then down a little bit again. And... Mm, the newest polls showed 31.8%, and so it's kind of everyone's optimistic again. People have different view of honesty and truth, but um, we are trying to um, create a participatory democracy. So we have to we have to be honest in valuing our feelings and opinions, and straightforward in that. After the 2008 financial collapse, people had been kind of led to believe that we're going to, that we're going to fix things and everything's going to get better and we all had to kind of work together and people had to have lesser pay and but we were society, we're going to build this up together. And when the Panama thing came out, you know, it was just a deal breaker and people were appalled. <laughs> There was just an amazing energy and unison, kind of feeling of unison that day. Like, we've had enough. We've had enough of these liars. In terms of financial misconduct, which we think a lot about in Iceland, many of us believe it's sort of like an addictive behavior. People, they uh, hope to reach a type of success as they have defined it. Maybe they come from a very wealthy family. Maybe dad made five billion and the son has to make five billion. Maybe it, it's something crucially connected to someone's self-image. Uh, but then at the same time, for change to work, we want to be able to look up on it in, in a benevolent way and look at it like a, like a failure, like an addiction of sort, like, like alcoholism. When people are, are, are greedy, when people betray their obligations, it's a type of a sickness. Um, and then we cannot look up on the individual in isolation. We have to think about how is our system functioning. People can see that, you know, we're, we're as honest as we possibly can about things, try to keep things open. And that's, I think, a key to fairness, is just that, that people can access information and that kind of belongs to them anyway. It's sometimes difficult for ourselves, but we know that we cannot give a class on ethics. We have to behave as we find is ethical because the children learn by what you exhibit, not by what you tell them. have a say in what's fair, what's not. It's always the adults that tell you uh, what to do. Like your mom will say, eat your vegetables. <laughs> and I might not think that's fair, but I do it because she's my mom. And then when we don't have a say, then the adults can do what they want and we can't do anything to stop them. When she got involved with this group, she was nine, and uh, the realities of the case are hitting closer to home. So as a mom, it was a little um, tender. Part of me wanted to protect her and not have her be involved in this lawsuit. So all 21 plaintiffs go, and we're in line and we're waiting, and that takes like a long while. And then we have to spend two hours in this court listening to old people talk about what they think is right and wrong. I'm of two minds. I mean, on one hand, I'm so proud of my daughter for getting involved, and I'm proud that she knows she has a voice and that she speaks up. Well, there's a cup and two plates. Right. Last spring? Yeah. Last fall here, you can just hand them to me. We're asking the government 
to take responsibility for their actions and to make sure that we have um, a planet and an environment that will last until the next generation and the generation after that. Hi, Julia. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me over. We launched legal actions in all 50 states in the United States and against the federal government. And then it has expanded globally since then. And so there are actions now happening in other countries. Like there's a case uh, to be filed next week in Pakistan on behalf of young people and soon after India. I think the court understands how important the case is and he tends to issue de decisions pretty quickly. Children are filing cases against their government using the public trust doctrine. The public trust doctrine is an ancient legal doctrine. It comes from Roman times. And it's pretty simple. It says the government is a trustee over essential natural resources. So the things that are vital to life, air and water, for example. And the citizens, including future generations, are the beneficiaries. And actually it's people like you, Hazel, and young people who inspire me to <laughs> keep that hope. I am incredibly hopeful. The youth in Washington state have already won one case against Washington using the public trust doctrine. And so we have precedent. What is it? Oh, that's what it is. Hold on. Back you go. There's fundamental questions of fairness because of what we're leaving to all future generations if we don't reverse course. There's a butterfly on the ground.